Good evening. Thank you for coming out for this special event. I have two announcements as we begin this evening. First, I want to invite you all to a reception that will be held immediately after the lecture this evening across the quad in the Wind Center. All are invited uh, to attend. There'll be uh, snacks and sweets and drinks. We'll be selling copies of our lecturer's award-winning book for $10 if you'd like to purchase a copy. And I'm sure he will uh, agree to sign your book if you'd like for him to. And of course, there'll be an opportunity to speak with him um, in the Wind Center. Secondly, after tonight's lecture, there will be a time of question and answer. So if you would like to ask a brief question, then please raise your hand at the appropriate time and a seminary student will bring you a microphone. Tonight, we honor Dr. Robert Jones, the founding CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute, for ideas in his 2016 book, The End of White Christian America. Dr. Jones holds a PhD in religion from Emory University, a Master of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a bachelor's degree in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. Before founding PRRI, Dr. Jones worked as a consultant and senior research fellow at several think tanks in Washington, DC, and he also was an assistant professor of religious studies at Missouri State University. In this book, Dr. Jones documents the rise and fall of the cultural and political influence of white Christian America over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries. In the first chapter, Jones defines white Christian America as white Protestants, bringing together, combining more progressive mainline and more conservative evangelical groups. And he notes that the heyday of white Christian America was in the 1950s when, quote, June Cleaver was its mother, Andy Griffith was its sheriff, Norman Rockwell was its artist, and Billy Graham and Norman Vincent Peale was its ministers. In another chapter, Dr. Jones provides the vital signs of white Christian America using research from PRRI, his institute. I'll give you two examples. First, white Christian American, White Christian Americans as a proportion of the overall electorate dropped from 73% of the electorate in 1992 to 57% of the electorate 20 years later in 2012. Another example of the vital signs of white Christian America. In 2010, the US Supreme Court had no Protestant judges for the first time in history. The book generated significant discussion among all three of the Grawlmeyer selection committees, especially concerning how Dr. Jones' thesis fits with the 2016 presidential election results. The book was written in a pre-Trump presidency world, but the book addresses Trumpism indirectly through the last chapter on stages of grief among descendants of white Christian America. The paperback version of the book now includes an afterword that was written after the elections, where Jones argues that the election of Trump does not represent the resurrection of white Christian America, but its death rattle. This is truly a book worthy of the Grawlmeyer Award, and we are delighted to have its author with us tonight. His lecture this evening is entitled, Why Religion is at the Heart of America's Identity Crisis. Dr. Jones, will you come forward now for the presentation? Yes. Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones, on behalf of Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary and the University of Louisville, I present you with the 2019 Grawlmeyer Award in Religion. Thank you, President uh, Pollard and uh, Professor Mayfield. Um, and for all the Grawemeyer um, Committee, I'm deeply, deeply honored um, to uh, be 
uh, receiving this award. Uh, if you look on the list of previous uh, uh, recipients, it's, it's such an amazing list of people who are I admire, who are my mentors, uh, you know, people who I've, uh, whose work I've depended on. And it's just such a great honor to, um, to be here um, and stand in that great uh, line of secession. Um, I'd like to start with uh, um, a reading from the beginning of the book. I um, began the book with a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek obituary to white Christian America, um, but I thought I would kind of start there to give you a sense of um, how I'm thinking about the term white Christian America, and then I'll spend some time unpacking uh, this and kind of bringing it into our present uh, day as much as, as, as I can. Um, but first, um, a reading from the obituary. After a long life spanning nearly 240 years, white Christian America, a prominent cultural force in the nation's history, has died. White Christian America first began to exhibit troubling symptoms in the 1960s when white mainline Protestants uh, denominations began to shrink, but showed signs of rallying with the rise of the Christian right in the 1980s. Following the 2004 presidential election, however, it became clear that white Christian America's powers were failing. Although examiners have not been able to pinpoint the exact time of death, the best evidence suggests that white Christian America finally succumbed in the latter part of the first decade of the 21st century. The cause of death was determined to be a combination of environmental and internal factors. Complications stemming from major demographic changes in the country, along with religious disaffiliation as many younger Americans and its own members begin to doubt white Christian America's continued relevance in a shifting cultural environment. Among, many, among white Christian America's many notable achievements was its service to the nation as a cultural touchstone during most of its life. It provided a shared aesthetic, a historical framework, and a moral vocabulary. White Christian America's vibrancy was historically one of the most prominent features of American public life. While the common cultural ground it offered did not prevent vehement and even bloody conflicts from erupting, the lingua franca of white Christian America gave them a coherent frame. But white Christian America has not been without its critics and controversies. Its reputation was especially marred by its general accommodation to and participation in the institution of slavery up until the Civil War. In the late 19th and 20th centuries, white Christian America's apathy toward, and in some quarters even staunch defense of, segregation in the American South did little to overturn these negative associations. Its credibility was also damaged when it became mired in partisan politics in the closing decades of the 20th century. Late in its life, white Christian America also struggled to adequately address issues such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, which were of particular importance to its younger members as well as younger Americans overall. White Christian America is survived by two principal branches of descendants, a white mainline Protestant family residing primarily in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, and an evangelical Protestant family living mostly in the South. Plans for a public memorial service have not been announced. Right. <laughs> Um, so it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek, uh, you know, take uh, on uh, this entity that I'm, I'm calling White Christian America, which I'll unpack in a moment. Um, but this image that I have on the screen, it's a little bit faint here, um, but I'll, I'll try to describe it for, for those in, in the back. It may not, it's a black and white image um, that I received in my, in, in my inbox in 2012 after the re-election of President Barack Obama. Um, and so it was just in that window between the election and Thanksgiving. Um, and if you can't quite make it out, it's basically a black and white photo of a white family uh, bowing their heads in prayer around the Thanksgiving table. The father is sitting at the head of the table and his children and uh, spouse are sitting along the side of it. Um, it evokes uh, in many ways uh, Norman Rockwell's freedom from want photo, right? It's, it, it, it has that feel uh, to it. Um, and when I got this in my inbox, it simply, the first caption that I saw was very simple. It just said, um, Christian family at prayer, Pennsylvania, 1942. Like, okay, this is kind of curious. And, it, and I, I looked at it, it was from the Christian Coalition of America, uh, which was a conservative, kind of politically active group on the um, kind of Republican and conservative side of politics. And I thought, okay, this is curious. This is like literally a week after uh, we just reelected our first African American president. Um, and then I read down um, in the email and it said this. Um, we will soon be celebrating the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving. 
and God has still not withheld his blessings upon this nation, although we now richly deserve such condemnation. We have a lot to give thanks for, but we also need to pray to our Heavenly Father and ask him to protect us from those enemies without and within who want to see America destroyed. Right, so really, really visceral, apocalyptic language, right, after the re-election of, of, of Obama. And, it, and at the time, I wasn't really working on the book yet, but I, I, it struck me that something quite curious was going on, that there was, this was the reaction and that this was the image, right, that was uh, kind of put there. And it really is a, a sense, I think, there was this sense of panic, uh, this sense of loss, uh, and that that uh, as I sort of, you know, continue to study and think that those themes just kept coming up uh, in our politics. So the beginning and the seeds of the book really was to try to figure out what is this about? Like, what is this visceral apocalyptic language? What's it rooted in uh, that we're kind of, that's kind of infecting our politics, that's kind of helping to drive partisan polarization, um, and this like rooted in a kind of religious, a particular religious view of the country. Um, so I'll uh, try to unpack this a little more. Um, so I use this term white Christian America. Before I go very much further, I want to make sure everyone understands what I mean by that. Um, I really am using it as a metaphor. Uh, so I'm certainly not using it to say uh, that this is the end of white Christian churches or denominations. Uh, you can pretty much go to any city block in America and walk two blocks and you would falsify that sort of a thesis. I'm certainly not saying it's the end of all white Christians uh, in the country. Um, there's enough people probably on the first row to falsify uh, that, you know, thesis. Um, and, but what I really am talking about is using it as a metaphor for this power structure and this cultural force uh, that has really been with us from the very beginning of the country forward. It really was a, it's both a cultural and political edifice. Uh, it was built primarily by white Protestant Christians, um, and it just set the tone for most everything in the, in the country. And, and uh, to kind of go back to the Protestant thing, we have this term for it, right? WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, right? Presbyterians, you're right there, right? Um, in the kind of waspy thing, like that's you. Um, and it, that was the sort of term for, for this kind of uh, world. And it's important to remember that it, it, in its beginning, it really was a Protestant cultural power that we're talking about. So it doesn't take that much long uh, or that much difficulty to remember back, you know, even as late as the 1960s and 70s, if you were gonna join your average country club, um, in the country, uh, there were certain kinds of requirements. Not everyone could join the local country club, right? And chances are, um, uh, in most of those places, they were really not only white, they were Protestant institutions. So if you were Jewish, not going to happen. If you were Catholic, probably not going to happen. So it wasn't just uh, African Americans and Latinos, uh, uh, but it was a very much designed to kind of protect, protect a white kind of Protestant cultural power. So it's that world that I'm really talking about. Um, so I'm going to talk about that world and then also the larger group of white Christians when you put them all together. That is white Catholics, white Protestants, uh, both evangelical and mainline and non-denominational churches and all of that. Because even if you put that world together, we're finding that we've moved, and this is kind of the basic thesis of the, of the book and pointing to uh, the changes in the country, we've gone from a country that demographically speaking was majority white and Christian just 10 years ago to one that is no longer majority white and Christian today. And it's that milestone and the reactions to that that I'm going to try to unpack. Uh, tonight. One way of thinking about this, so I'm from the South, I grew up, my, my parents are both from Bibb County, Georgia, grew up, um, both of them grew up in Macon. Uh, I grew up, I was born in Atlanta, grew up in Mississippi. Um, and one of the things that I remember early on as a childhood going to a family funeral um, was that there was this open casket tradition, right, that was quite shocking to me as a kid the first time that I saw it. And I remember asking my parents, like, like, what? that's kind of weird, like, what's going on, right? There's this kind of body, and like, really? Like, I don't know, and, and I remember my, my mother, you know, the line was, well, look, it's sometimes hard to find closure if you don't see the body, right? And, and it's hard to just kind of come to terms with the passing of someone who seems so full of life and so much a part of your life, um, unless you can see the body. One way of thinking about the book, and I think in what I'm sort of up to with the, the data, um, is um, laying out the body um, of white Christian America, um, right? Uh, so you can see it, you can touch it, um, and the, what's, the, what's the point of it? I think the point of it is um, that unless you get sort of, you know, through a grieving process and into something like acceptance, 
you sort of get stuck, right? Um, in your emotional development, it creates other problems in your life. And I think that there's a real sense in which um, the nation um, has to kind of come to terms with the passing of this important figure in its life. Uh, for some, it brought a lot of great things. For others, um, it brought a lot of grief. Um, and so thinking about how the country as a whole kind of sees this and, um, and comes to terms with it and is, finds a way to move forward, I think is one way of thinking about what I'm up to. So also for the sake of those who aren't so crazy about numbers and statistics, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of them. Um, so I was going to warn you. Um, but I'm going to try to tell a story with them. And uh, one thing, especially with the screen being a little bit dim, don't worry too much about not being able to see the numbers. Um, it's really the patterns that I'm going to point to, and I'm going to describe them, because I think about the last third of the room, it's probably not, it's going to be hard to even make out the, the patterns, given the, the light pattern here. But, but I'll describe them, and it really is the overall patterns that are the most important thing here. Uh, and so if, if uh, you know, there's some of you who are like math geeks like me and are all excited about the numbers, um, uh, for those who are looking for the exits, um, just think about these as maybe vital signs, right, is another way to think. We'll stay with the medical metaphor um, here and think about these as vital signs of white Christian America and uh, where it's been and where, where we are today. Um, so if I uh, could only show one chart, it might be this one. Now, there's no numbers up there yet, so um, uh, I'm going to put them up there. But I'm going to show two things. One of them is the percentage of white Christians in the, as a proportion of the population over time. This doesn't go back that far. It just goes back to 2004 uh, to today. And then the second line I'm going to put up uh, is the support for same-sex marriage in the country as kind of a cultural bellwether issue, uh, as one way of seeing um, the change here. So here's the first one. So that's the proportion of white Christians in the country. So that's everyone, Protestant, Catholic, non-denominational, Orthodox, anyone who self-identifies as white, non-Hispanic, and Christian. And if you see, if you go back to 2004, uh, it's about 6 in 10, it's 59% of those, and if you bring it up, um, and, and I've kind of blocked in that gray mark is uh, President Obama's uh, time in office, not because there's anything causal there, but just as a kind of framework of seeing um, that these things happen, I think it's not um, insignificant that these changes occur during the tenure of our first African-American president, right? So we have this kind of symbolic figure um, as, as president that is in, uh, kind of representing change uh, and a new uh, face of, um, of the country. At the same time, we have these uh, demographic changes going on. So if we go to 2008 even, the country's still 54% white and Christian when it, uh, uh, Obama's first running for office. By the time we get to the Trump-Clinton election, that number has dropped to 43 Right, so it's 11 percentage points uh, between 2008 and 2016. Uh, in the last two years, as we kept uh, tracing this out, it's dropped from 43 to 41. It's essentially 1.3 percentage points a year um, over the last decade that the percentage of white uh, Christians has dropped in the country. Now, uh, that's super fast in, in, for demographic shift in the country. These are usually glacial changes, but this is very, very fast. Um, the other uh, piece I'll put up here, this is support uh, for same-sex marriage over the same time period. So if you, again, if you kind of go uh, use Barack Obama's first uh, election, uh, 2008, as a, a kind of benchmark here, only about four in 10 Americans supported same-sex marriage um, in 2008. Uh, Barack Obama himself, you may recall, did not support same-sex marriage in 2008. That came uh, much later. Um, by the time you get again to the 2016 election, that number has completely flipped on its head. It's gone from four in 10 supporting to only four in 10 against and six and 10 supporting. And you can see the number keeps going up, right? So our latest numbers at the end of 2018 were 64% uh, support for same-sex marriage. And among young people, it's north of 80% uh, among Americans under the age of 30. All right, so near consensus issue. Now, just as one way of kind of just pausing here for a moment before I break down a, a little bit more of the trends and stuff, if you're a conservative, white, evangelical Protestant, like this is a head-spinning amount of change. Right, because uh, that group has been um, sort of basically all in opposing gay rights as an issue at the top of the agenda for decades, um, and it's a group that had been used to being right the moral majority, right, uh, part of uh, are having the sense that they were represented by the uh, kind of center of American public life. So finding themselves demographically decentered and on the margins, and no longer the majority, and then on this issue, this kind of bellwether issue 
one, they were all in opposing losing not only in the court of public opinion, but also at the U.S. Supreme Court in 2015. Right, so that's a lot of things going on. Our first African American president, um, it's a lot in the mix. And I wanna just kind of pause there to kind of say, if we're wondering why there's a lot of uh, anxiety, fear, anger uh, in our politics, this is a volatile mix of things um, ha happening all at once. Um, so let me kind of unpack this a little more. Um, so this is a pie chart with the kind of the big uh, groups of uh, American religious groups. I'll again unpack it. The kind of uh, smaller or the the wedge here on the right is the a number of white Christians in the country, just over four in ten, it's the same number from before. But I thought I'd give you the bigger picture here. Um, about a quarter of Americans, that's the green wedge on the bottom, um, are th that's non-white Christians. So that's mostly Latino and African American Christians in that box. Um, the smaller orange wedge there, that's um, at at um, six percent, is all non-Christian religions. So that's all Muslims, all Jews, all Hindus. Uh, Jains, Sikhs, you know, every group that's not religious but not Christian uh, is in that 6% that box. And then the, the bigger wedge over here on the corner, 25%, uh, a quarter of Americans today claim no religious affiliation at all. Um, now that number, just to kind of give you some perspective on that, um, has um, gotten, uh, it's, it's essentially quintupled since the 1990s. Uh, so when we do doing some public opinion surveys in the 1990s, uh, only about 5 or 6% of Americans claim no religious affiliation at all. That number, and again, so it's 25% uh, today. And the, the general picture in the American religious landscape is this, white Christian groups shrinking, African American groups staying about the same, Latino Christian groups growing, uh, and this wedge of uh, uh, the religiously unaffiliated growing as well. So that's the basic dynamics um, in the, uh, in the um, uh, landscape. So one thing I want to kind of put up here is, um, I'm going to back up, this, this chart that may help you understand generational changes and how, this is also another way of seeing just how fast these changes have come. So this chart is gonna be um, young people on the top. You can think about it as um, kind of an archeological dig down through generational strata, right? Uh, so there's young people on the top uh, and it kind of goes successfully down, seniors on the bottom. The first bar I'm gonna put up is just the percentage of white Christians in each of these generational groups, right? So you can see it's like almost, you could take a ruler and it's almost linear. You could just kind of draw a straight line through here, but um, the, it's basically 40 percentage points different between seniors and young people to, and, and Americans under the age of 30. So among seniors, 63%, nearly two thirds of seniors are identify as white and Christian. But among young people today, it's less than a quarter, it's 23%. Uh, so that's really quite uh, dramatic. Um, just among Americans who are alive today, that's how much shift we've seen just in the, just in the generations we have. There and if I fill in the rest of it, you can see the, the bookend here. Really, is the the orange uh, piece on the far end is religiously unaffiliated Americans. So again, you see among seniors, only 13% of seniors, just a little over one in 10, claim no religious affiliation today. But among young people, it's 40% right, who claim no religious affiliation. Now, that's not just people who don't go to church or synagogue or, or mosque, it's people who will not claim the label Christian in any way, right? So it's when we ask, what is your religion? Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? Are you Jewish? Are you Hindu? These people go through the whole list and they say, no, I am either atheist, agnostic, or nothing uh, in particular. So they're, they're, it's a much kind of a harder push off uh, than just I'm not going, you know, attending a, a, a congregation. Um, anymore. Uh, so again, you know, it's, it's a, a, almost a factor of four difference between seniors um, and young people uh, today. Uh, to put this in perspective, because um, one of the questions I get a lot is, well, okay, look, aren't people in their 20s always more unaffiliated than they are later in life? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, but what I've done here is I've put a snapshot up of what each generation of cohort looked like at different points in time. So I can compare people who were in their 20s in 1986, people who were in their 20s in 1996, people who were in their 20s in 2006, and people in their 20s in 2016. So it's basically 10 year snapshots. And what you can see is that in 1986, even among people in their 20s, only one in 10 were religiously unaffiliated. Right, so the number we have today is four times that of even people in their 20s uh, from 1986, right? So it's genuinely something new. Uh, this is not just something every generation has done. This generation is actually doing something new and orienting toward religion in a much different way than we've really ever seen uh, as long as we've been tracking uh, this, this kind of data. 
Uh, the other thing to say is that uh, this decline among white Christians in particular uh, is not confined, confined to one uh, Christian subgroup. So it's not confined to the white mainline Protestants, which is where kind of Presbyterians and Episcopalians fit in. Uh, it's not confined to white Catholics. Um, and it's not even confined, uh, or, and it also now includes white evangelical Protestants. So I think the kind of conventional wisdom has been uh, that white evangelicals are growing and vibrant while everybody else is in decline. Uh, and there was some truth to that about 10 years ago. But in the last 10 years, interestingly enough, white evangelical Protestants have actually been shrinking at a rate higher than white mainline Protestants over the last decades. So there's been a kind of a second wave of white Christian decline that's really um, um, uh, so this is the, the curve for white evangelical Protestants as a proportion of the population, 2006 uh, to 2017. So it goes from 23% of the population uh, in 2006 down to 15% of the population today. Um, so it's a fairly steep drop, and this is among the white evangelical uh, world. This also matches, by the way, even internal data. So uh, Southern Baptist Convention, the, um, the denomination in which I grew up, has lost over a million members in the last decade. Um, so absolute, you know, absolute losses among them, and that has not been true before 10 years ago. Um, here are the, also the white mainline Protestant and the um, white Catholic drops. You can see they're basically all in the same direction. Uh, but one thing I will point out, though, um, especially since we're here at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, uh, is that there has been a, a plateauing of the main line, right? So this drop has actually plateaued. Um, if you look at those last couple of data points, uh, it's 13.7, then it went to 12.8, and then back up to 13.3. So it looks like there's a kind of stabilizing of the main line after a few decades of uh, fairly, steady, uh, fairly steady drops, but the evangelical numbers um, look much steeper uh, than that over time. The other thing to say is that um, this change that I'm talking about in the country um, isn't being driven just by uh, like the coast. It's not a California and New England thing, right? Uh, or even a big city thing. It's really happening pretty much everywhere. Um, and so one of the things I want to put up here is um, a, a slide, and this is the, again, don't worry about the numbers, but um, if you can make out the difference between dark and light even, even on this chart, uh, this is, uh, you know, all, fi all 50 states. The darker numbers here indicate a higher concentration of people who identify as white and Christian, and the lighter green and into yellow numbers are lower uh, numbers. This is 2007. All right, so again, darker uh, is higher concentrations, and, and basically it's what you'd expect. There's kind of a U shape uh, that comes down through the Ozark Mountains, back up through the Appalachian Mountains. That's where the kind of higher concentrations of white um, Christians are um, in the country. Midwest and then up, up through the Appalachian Mountains. Kentucky's right in the middle of that. Uh, so just watch. I'm going to flip back and forth so you can see it a couple times, but just look for the kind of dark changing into light. Uh, patterns and these these changes in most states represent about 10 percentage points from wherever the state started. Uh, so that's 2007. Here's 2017. All right. So back to 2007. There's 2017. Right, so pretty dramatic, right? And, and it's, it's Kansas, it's Oklahoma, it's Kentucky. It's not just, um, you know, the kind of states where you think in the Southwest or Texas where we know there's a lot of uh, demographic change. But I think this is why it's being felt kind of everywhere um, it, because it, it really is happening um, in a fairly uniform way that's hard to find in a state uh, that, that has much of an exception here. Um, so that's what's going on in the population. Um, but let me give you a little bit of a caveat. Um, uh, Tyler and I were joking about, um, you know, that, so the book came out uh, originally in 2016 ahead of the election, but it was relying on, when I submitted the manuscript, it was relying on 2014 data, right? So there's no mention of Trump, there's no mention of Clinton. Uh, that's not even on the radar screen when the book goes to press. Um, and so, of course, like once the election happens, I get a fair amount of snarky email, right? Um, and uh, some snarky tweets saying, don't you want to put an asterisk at the end of that, you know, with a little disclaimer down here at the bottom uh, of your title. Um, and so I wanted to say a little bit about what's going on and why there's this kind of weird, um, if, if all of this is true, like how do we get 2016, the, right? How, do, how does that happen? So I'm gonna kind of try to unpack that a bit uh, for you. The answer is that Republicans have a time machine. That's the answer. Um, now, let me say a little bit about what's going on here. So Demo Democrats have the, win, the demographic wins at their back 
but Republicans have a time machine. Um, and so far, the time machine is, is winning. Um, so um, Tyler mentioned these numbers. These are the numbers from the electorate. Um, so people, people who were actually voted um, in elections. These numbers are all from the national exit polls, um, the official uh, ones that the media organizations uh, sponsor. And you can see the same pattern. Again, these are white Christians um, and the electorate uh, going forward. And you can see, you know, if we go back to Bill Clinton's election in 92, um, 73%, nearly three quarters of voters are white and Christian. Uh, by the time we get to 2012 um, uh, or 2008 again, it's down to six and 10, uh, 50, 60, 61%. Um, our best estimates, we don't have the final numbers yet, but our best estimates that it has dropped to 55 in 2018. Um, but it won't be till 2024 until the realities that are already on the ground in the country will be reflected at the ballot box, right? You kind of notice there's a lag effect, and the lag effect is about two presidential election cycles, so about eight to ten year lag. So what I mean by a time machine is that uh, what's happening is the main reason for this is that white Christians turn out to vote at rates higher than other Americans do. So there is, uh, they are continually overrepresented um, at the ballot box, which has the effect, because these trends are linear, it has the effect of taking us back about eight to 10 years. So one way of thinking about the 2020 election is that it's not the 2020 election, it's the 2012 election in terms of demographics um, in the country, and, and particularly in terms of race and religious demographics um, in the country. So let me illustrate this with white evangelicals as a, as a real test case, the kind of base of um, uh, Republican support and President Trump support in the country. So these are two bars. It's going 2008 to 2018, so again, a decade here. The dark uh, bars are the ones I've been talking about, the proportion of the population, right? So they've gone, white evangelicals have gone from 21% to 15% in the population. That's that trend line kind of sloping down. Um, the light blue bars are the percent that white evangelicals have been of voters in every presidential election. And you'll notice they haven't moved, right? It is, in 2008, uh, the delta between um, the percentage that white evangelicals were in the population was five percentage points. So they're 21 percent of the population, 26 percent of voters. They were five percentage points overrepresented at the ballot box. In the midterm elections in 2018, they were 15 percent of the population and still 26 percent of voters. So 11 percentage points overrepresented um, at the ballot box. So one of the ways that this kind of illusion has, is still with us is that the ballot box, again, looks very different than the population um, as a whole. But, you know, going to kind of slip back to this one, but I think what we're seeing is that you can think about this as kind of a rubber band, that difference between percent of the population and percent of voters. And it's been stretched and stretched and stretched. And at 11 percentage points, it's about at the breaking point. At some point, that rubber band snaps. And I think we're about there. I would expect that in 2020, we're going to see a little bit of a dip. But again, it's not going to be till 2024 that the full realities of what we already have on the ground are going to express themselves um, at the ballot box. So um, that's a bit of a um, kind of one of the things that's kind of going on um, uh, there. And I can say a little bit more about that in the Q&A if, if we want to come back to that. Um, so one, one thing I've spent um, an enormous amount of time over the last two years, um, in fact, I did a press call today um, in Tyler's office um, talking to the Houston Chronicle about um, so what's going on with white evangelical values voters and their support for President Trump? Like, how do we understand that? Like, what's happening? Um, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time kind of unpacking that as well, because I think this data gives us some insight into understanding a little bit of what's uh, going on. I've got this kind of, this section titled, um, uh, end of life bargaining from values voters to nostalgia voters. Um, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, so first of all, I'm going to need a little bit of help from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, all right, so uh, this is, for those of you who haven't read it, um, this is her kind of famous Stages of Grief. Uh, it was written from her work uh, with dying patients and kind of noticing a pattern that people went through as they received kind of a terminal diagnosis and trying to wrap their heads around it, trying to come to terms with it. And she kind of saw these, these stages that I think is helpful in under, help us understanding the political context as well. Um, and the stages were, you know, she said, are not really linear, but she did usually see them all expressed in some way, but they had some kind of a, a path to them, even if people looped back or regressed. And it was basically this, like, so the first thing when you get a bad uh, prognosis is denial, 
right? Nope, can't be right, run the test again. Um, that's the kind of first stage. Uh, after the test gets run two or three times and you get conf confirmatory second opinions um, and you can't quite do denial, the next sort of piece of this is usually anger, right? Anger that is unfair, uh, anger why me, um, those kinds of things. Um, once that sort of, you know, you work your way through that, often uh, there was uh, the sense of bargaining. So what can I do to get out of it, right? Okay, I'm, I'm angry, I can't do it, but what can I do to get out of it? Um, can I, and usually it would, it would go in the kind of end of life context, a patient would say things like, oh, you know, it would be kind of often in the form of prayer. Like, God, like if you will let me see my granddaughter's wedding, I will donate money, right, to the charity, right? Uh, if you will, uh, you know, just let me get to my anniversary date. You know, I will, uh, I will volunteer at the soup kitchen between, every day between now and then. Now, you know, like it sounds a little kooky, right, in this context, but um, when you're sitting in that space, um, it's, it's a prayer of desperation, right, is what it really is. Um, and, and, you know, she described that, and then once you've realized, okay, that's probably not gonna happen, I, you can't really bargain your way out of it, there's some kind of depression and then into acceptance. So that's the kind of main flow of it. I think it's helpful for maybe us to think about um, one way of understanding white evangelicals and their, um, the deal they brokered with Trump is to think about um, them being somewhere between anger and bargaining um, on this issue, right? And so I think denial is done because even the Southern Baptist Convention itself is self-reporting like losses of a million members over the last 10 years. Like that's new uh, and it's news and, and there's not a lot of denial, but there is a kind of anger um, and it comes from a sense of entitlement, uh, loss of power, like those kinds of things, used to being the center of the country and all of a sudden finding yourself displaced. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the easiest way to understand um, this relationship with President Trump is, is a, it's a kind of grand bargain made in desperate circumstances. Um, and you could hear even President Trump picking up on this at the end of the campaign trail when he was speaking to um, religious audiences and they were almost always white evangelical religious audiences. You would hear him saying things like, look folks, he would like lean in, I'm your last chance. You know, like if you don't vote for me, you're not gonna see another Republican like me, you know, anytime soon. And he would very quickly tie it to immigration. And you know, the, there are hordes of people gonna uh, pour over the borders, are gonna get registered to vote. You're gonna be outnumbered. So it's either me or a very different future. And, and that was the appeal. Um, and I think in many ways that appeal, you know, with the kind of make America great again, it was that last word again, a kind of restorationist um, approach that was the real appeal. So let me throw some data behind it so you don't think I'm just making this up. Um, so uh, first of all, I would say that it has been remarkable. We've been tracing um, uh, white evangelical Protestant support for Donald Trump as like a favorability measure since before the election. So from 2015 all the way up to the end of last year, this curve I'm about to show you. So this is all Americans. Uh, support for Donald Trump. It never breaks 43 percentage points as long as we've been tracking it from 2015 to today. Like his ceiling has been 43. Um, here are white evangelical Protestants, right? Um, and you'll look, it looks like um, basically for, um, before he gets the nomination, his, his, uh, um, his favorability never goes above 50% among white evangelicals. But once he gets the nomination, it jumps to 61. Uh, by the time of the election, it's at 68. And by the inauguration, it's at 74, right? So that's very quick ascendancy. And since the inauguration, it has never dipped below 65, right? It's been as high as 77 and as low as 65. It's somewhere in that band um, all the way out um, through, you know, every piece of news that's come out, every, every um, scandal, all of that, all the way out through somewhere in the two-third, basically two-thirds support um, uh, uh, for President Trump. So it's been very, very steady. Um, one... Uh, other piece of information here is that we, we asked about, uh, you know, it really comes down to like uh, this question of like, what does a values voter mean, right, in this context? Um, and we asked a question in 2011 that I think uh, gives give some light on this. What we asked is, um, it's essentially a question about candidates' character. And the question said, do you agree or disagree that an, uh, a candidate who are an elected official who commits an immoral act in their private life can still behave ethically and perform their duties in their public life. So we asked this in 2011. In 2011, only 30% of white evangelicals agreed that this was possible. Now that's about what you'd expect from a kind of self-described 
values voter um, constituency. Um, we asked this question again in 2016, just ahead of the election, with Trump at the top of the ticket. The number went from 30 to 72 uh, percent, right, uh, of, who, of people saying that uh, you could still do this, commit an immoral, immoral act your private life, essentially build a wall, right, between your private life and your, um, and your <laughs> public life. Um, here and evangelicals were sort of uh, bought that, um, and so. But this is, I think, something to take. I mean, it, it was a kind of shocking finding. It was one that, like, I actually sent the research team back and said, "Yeah, this can't be right. Like, run that again." Um, and we kind of, you know, really had to kick the tire. And, and sure enough, it's right. Um, and but I think taking this seriously, what does that mean, right? So it. I think if you kind of take it back to the bargaining thing, one of the things that means, I think, is that you know, people, uh, people make desperate deals in desperate times. And I think that's really part of what's happened here is that this end game of holding on uh, to the America that they found, that they felt, felt themselves being at the center of was so important that the means became sort of immaterial. Um, in some ways. So it's a real shift in a political ethic, uh, but it shows you the power of where we are, that a political ethic that was about principle, like here's our principles, we're values voters, we'll let the chips fall where they may, um, transformed really into kind of a consequentialist ethic of an end justifies the means uh, approach is quite a dramatic uh, sea change. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about um, kind of uh, how this has pushed us into kind of a tribalist uh, uh, space in our in our politics and how religion and race and partisanship are really have formed this um, uh, really uh, I think really dangerous amalgam here so again don't worry about all the kind of things here but what I have all the numbers on the left here this is kind of a snapshot from 2006 and 2017 um, the all you really need to look at is the blue very shades of blue are different kinds of white Christians uh, among Republicans and Democrats. So in 20, 2006, the parties looked different, um, so, and, but uh, not as different as they do today. So in 2006, about eight in 10 Republicans identified as white and Christian, so a fairly homogeneous um, group, uh, compared to about half of Democrats. Uh, so there was basically like a 30 percentage point gap uh, between Republicans and Democrats on uh, the percentage that they um, identified as white and Christian. Uh, by 2017, uh, Republicans had dropped a little bit, but are still 70% white and Christian. Uh, Democrats are now only about 3 in 10 uh, white and Christian. So you get this kind of increasing racial and religious gap between the two political parties. Um, and Democrats are sort of like, uh, you know, almost a quarter of Democrats are today are, uh, well, more than a quarter, 27%, are religiously unaffiliated uh, groups. Uh, and uh, among Republicans, it's uh, only 12 uh, percent are religiously unaffiliated. So you basically have this kind of increasing move toward Republicans increasingly becoming a white Christian kind of homogeneous party with Democrats kind of becoming the party of kind of everybody else. Um, and it's, um, I think, with that distance getting bigger, um, things like compromise become much harder, right, if we have my tribe and your tribe and it's wrapped up with race and religion and not just party, um, that becomes a difficult thing. Um, this, this slide, if you can see at the back, it's called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Um, uh, and uh, we asked people, uh, this is one of the more interesting and fun questions to ask. This was a survey from just last month. Um, uh, how unhappy they would be if their son or their daughter married someone who is fill in the blank. Right? So here's who we filled in the blank with. Someone who identifies as transgender, someone who is the same gender as your son or daughter, someone who is a supporter of the Democratic Party, someone who belongs to a different religious group, someone who is a different race or ethnicity, or someone who is a supporter of the Republican Party. Um, so I'll give you the partisan ones first. Um, so uh, if you asked Republicans uh, how unhappy they would be, 35% of them say they would be someone or very unhappy if their son or daughter married a Democrat. Uh, Democrats, 45% uh, said they would be somewhat or very unhappy if their son or daughter married a Republican, right, the other way around. So, but to put this in perspective, um, we, we asked this question because there was a, um, a great study at, at Stanford uh, that asked this question in 1960. The answer for both political parties in 1960 was five who said they would be very, someone are very unhappy if their son or daughter married somebody of the opposite political party. So we've come a long way, right, from those days where we are literally like taking our partisanship to bed with us um, at night as a kind of integral part of identity uh, today. The other thing here, I won't go through all of these, but um, 
if you ask the question, who are uh, Democrats versus Republicans most afraid of their son or daughter uh, marrying, uh, the answer for um, uh, Republicans is they're most worried about their son or daughter marrying someone who identifies as transgender, 70%. The answer for Democrats is Republicans. Um, all right. Um, so, the, <laughs> um, it's pretty stark. Um, moving on. Um, okay. Uh, so, you know, again, this is another, another take on this is we ask, uh, also just feelings about the other political party. Um, and we had a three-part response, and, and we asked Democrats about Republicans and vice versa, and we said, look, do you, when you think about the other party, um, do you think they're, you know, generally moving the country in the right direction, uh, or do you think they're somewhat misguided but not dangerous, or do you think they are so misguided they, they pose a fundamental threat to the country? Right, those are the three options. So um, here are the numbers of, of both parties who say the other party's moving uh, the country in the right direction, right, almost none. Um, here's the number uh, for uh, people saying they are somewhat misguided but not dangerous. It's about four in ten. Of each, it's very symmetrical of each party saying that. And here's the number of people saying they are so misguided they pose a fundamental threat uh, to the country. It's majority territory in both parties. 52% of Democrats say that about Republicans and 54% of Republicans say that about Democrats. So you can just really see um, you know, this, this space. The other thing to say is that um, the two parties have taken on um, very different positions on the kind of basic questions about pluralism um, in the country, and that that has become increasingly a divide uh, between the two. Um, so I've got two questions here. One of them is about racial diversity. The second one I'll show you is the same question set up, but about um, religious diversity in the country. So what we did on this question is we had, a, it was online, so we had a slider and we had two statements out on each poll, and you could take your mouse, and you could move the slider closer or further away from either statement, depending on how strongly you felt about it. And the setup was this, you know, give us, uh, when you think about the composition of the, or the kind of country you wanna live in, um, which of the two statements is closer to your view? One is, I prefer a nation made up of people from all over the world, that's statement A, uh, that's the one over here on the left. Um, statement B, I would prefer the U.S. to be a nation primarily made up of people from, the we from Western European heritage. Now, there's not many takers on the Western European heritage thing over there on the right, just straight up saying that. Um, but if you look on the left, there is a huge partisan gulf uh, between those. Uh, so you have basically two-thirds of Democrats saying that they prefer a nation made up from, of people from all over the world versus only 29 percent of Republicans. Most Republicans are somewhere in the middle, kind of ambivalent about this question. So that's kind of two very different uh, kinds of visions about like who the country ought to be. Um, you see a very similar thing on religious uh, divides here. It's a little less pronounced, um, but you have more Republicans uh, willing to sort of uh, take statement B. So these read um, statement A, I prefer to live in a nation made up of people belonging to a wide variety of religions. Statement B, I prefer to live in a nation primarily made up of people who follow the Christian faith. Um, so the one on the right is the Christian faith. 40% um, of Republicans are, are over there. About 45% of Republicans are in the middle. Uh, but on the religious diversity side, um, again, you got a majority of Democrats, 54%, but only 12% of Republicans um, over there on the side of um, living, uh, uh, people belong to a wide variety of religions. Uh, one more on the partisan polar, uh, polarization and um, then I will, um, actually two more, two more on this and I'll uh, kind of move toward landing the plane and we'll get to some questions. Uh, so uh, this question turned out to be one of the most predictive questions. We asked this uh, first in a 2016 survey right ahead of the election. Um, we, we do a, a, a survey every year with, uh, with Brookings, uh, with the Brookings Institution and, and in election years we do uh, it mostly on the election. So we did this with Brookings and we were sitting around a table trying to figure out like what questions should we put on the questionnaire this year uh, and usually we try to do it around issues, what issues are causing the most debate and we were kind of stumped uh, around the 2016 election because it just didn't seem like it was about issues at the end of the day. Um, and so we finally landed on asking, we did ask some issue questions, but we also asked this question. Um, and it reads, since the 1950s, do you think American culture and way of life has mostly changed for the better or has it mostly changed for the worse? So it turns out that this question divides the country right down the middle. Um, so there are, um, so here, that, that number in the middle is uh, kind of the divided all Americans. And I, you, I'm sure you can't read the, uh, the groups. So these are not mutually exclusive groups, but let me give you the flavor of this. These are the groups on the left-hand side who say, uh, American culture way of life has mostly changed for the better. Democrats, 
religiously unaffiliated uh, Americans, Hispanics, African Americans, Americans under the age of 30, and whites with a college degree. Right? That's who think the country's changed for the better since the 1950s. On the other side um, is uh, uh, actually whites overall, um, whites, and particularly whites with no college degree, uh, seniors age 65 or older, white mainline Protestants, Republicans, and white evangelical Protestants, right, um, over on this side of the, uh, oh, and white Catholics. So it's all white, sub, white Christian subgroups over on this side uh, saying things have changed for the worse. There's no group, though, that thinks things have changed for the worse more than white evangelical Protestants. Three quarters of white evangelical Protestants say things have changed for the worse uh, since the 1950s. So um, we also had a question where we asked, so that's looking back. We asked a different kind of question looking forward. Um, and the question was really about census projections and whether the changing demographics would be a good thing or a bad thing. So we, the statement is, uh, U.S. census projections show that by 2043, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, and other mixed racial and ethnic groups will together be a majority of the population. Do you think the likely impact of this coming demographic change will be mostly positive or mostly negative? Now, there are more Americans who think this is going to be a positive change than not, uh, so unlike the other one that uh, really split people down the middle. So about um, a little less than two-thirds of Americans say things are going to, this is going to be a mostly positive change, but the sorting of these groups and the intensity of the feelings is really the same. Um, so again, to the right here and, and the groups, uh, but there's really only two groups that fall, or three, that fall below majority here. They are whites without a college degree, Republicans, and white evangelical Protestants, right, who, uh, who say these will be mostly a change for the worse um, out there on the, uh, on the far side. So whether you're looking back or you're looking forward, um, this sense of uh, things changing and changing in a, not in a, a direction we want is, is part of, I think, this, uh, my dubbing folks, nostalgia voters, right? That one of the things we've seen in the last election cycle was this group really got converted from being, uh, again, values voters to being more like nostalgia voters, uh, looking back and trying to preserve an America that they feel like is slipping away. Um, so I'll put a fine point on it with this. Um, I don't know, it, this may be hard to see, it's, it's unfortunate uh, if you can't see it in the back, but basically this is, uh, on the left is Norman Rockwell's Freedom From Want uh, painting. Um, it has, a very similar to that first image that I showed you, has uh, the father at the head of the table, the, uh, the sort of m mother figure is in an apron holding the turkey over the table and the kids are all leaning in. Uh, there's an artist um, uh, that, that was just right up uh, named uh, Hank, Hank Willis Thomas and a photographer named Emily Schur who have been recreating Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms series with a diverse America subbed in. Uh, for uh, the mostly white subjects in the original uh, set of paintings. So this is Freedom From Want. Um, it has uh, a number, so mostly it looks like mostly Latino family in, um, in the thing, and it's also gender reverse, right? It's the man with the robe on and the turkey instead of the woman. Uh, there's an African-American figure on the right-hand side as well, um, and it's a really different table scene um, here. And, you know, it's, it's worth kind of noting that, like, this was a, it, you know, those paintings that came out, they came out in the 40s. So it was in the middle of the war. Uh, it was really about patriotism and helping people feel good about America and who we were. But it was a very idyllic and a very white, um, you know, set of sense of who we were. And it's important to remember, like when this, when Norman Rockwell's Freedom from Want uh, was was made, um, it's important. We also had Japanese Americans being imprisoned uh, uh, and and war camps at the same time, right? So this idyllic vision was never, you know, this is pre-Brown v. Board of Education. We it's Jim Crow South, like that's all going on too. Um, but there was this image, and I think part of the the challenge I think is letting go of that mythology, right? And moving, I think, toward a, a welcoming a more diverse set um, of an image and thinking about. Um, just who we are um, as the country. So I'm going to close with um, uh, a passage toward the end of the book um, that kind of gets to, I think, this, um, this, this shift um, in, the, in the country and, and kind of what, uh, what, what the challenges are before us, then we'll take some questions. As alluring as turning back the clock may seem to white Christian America's loyalists, efforts to resurrect the dead are futile at best and at worst, disrespectful to its memory. Like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, resurrection by human power rather than divine spirit always produces a monstrosity. If resurrection is not possible, 
both white evangelicals and white mainline Protestants, each still representing sizable constituencies in the country, will need to choose between sectarian retreat and a new kind of engagement. It seems highly unlikely that the descendants of white Christian America, having seen themselves at the American center for so long, will find a self-imposed marginal social presence palatable. But if this option proves unsatisfying, the only other course is a different social arrangement in which white evangelical and white mainline Protestants find their seats at the table alongside their fellow Christians of color, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and the religiously unaffiliated. And this time, they will be guests rather than hosts. There.